He's the great shepherd, the rock of all ages, almighty God is he. Bow down before him, love and adore him. His name is wonderful. Jesus, my, my Lord, I tell you, you just... Uh, We were singing these choruses, magnifying the name of the Lord. Wonderful, wonderful Jesus is to me. Counselor, Prince of Peace, mighty God is he. And we were singing, oh, for a thousand tongues to sing. Oh, for a thousand hands to raise. Another of the choruses we sometimes sing says, I just can't praise him enough. I can't uh, thank him enough. I just can't tell him how much. He means to me and we were made in his likeness and created in his image but we were brought here to serve the Lord and, uh, and I just think it's awesome to, to be able to to express how we feel about this great Lord who loved us saved us brought us where we are today through his grace, through his abundant mercy, through his love. What a mighty God we serve. And it was his grace and his grace alone that saved us. There's a scripture we all know very well, but in the second chapter of the book of Ephesians, the letter that Paul was writing to the church at Ephesus, when he was writing to them from prison, he said in Ephesians 2 and verse 8, he said, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. It's not of works, lest any man should boast. It's not that we could do anything to save ourselves. It just was a gift of God. It was grace. It was grace. There's a Because of what Jesus did, this wonderful counselor and prince of peace, if you turn to the 10th chapter of the book of Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 10, tells us what our Lord did for us uh, once and forever. In Hebrews 10 and verse 12, but this man, Jesus, this wonderful counselor, this prince of peace, this man, after he offered one sacrifice for sins forever, once and forever, the sacrifice of Jesus paid the debt you could not pay the once and forever sacrifice of Jesus absorbed all of the wrath of God against sin so that you don't have to feel it once and forever Jesus did on the cross the work that we could not have done for ourselves there's none righteous no not one there's none that seeketh after God Paul went through all of these Old Testament scriptures in the third chapter of Romans to say that there's none of us who are good enough uh, no one is righteous enough. No one is holy enough to earn salvation. You cannot earn eternal life, but it can be given to you free, freely, because of this great champion, this great Lord of ours. So excited about what the Lord has done for us. But you always need to, to balance and keep in mind that, that the risk of this knowledge of a great free salvation is that some people might think, well, then I don't need to do anything. It's not up to me, it was up to Jesus. I don't really have to live right. I don't really have to act right. I don't have to crucify the flesh. I don't really have to sacrifice and deny myself the pleasures of this life. People get the wrong idea sometimes and they'll even quote scriptures to support the wrong idea. One of the scriptures that people support their wrong idea with is comes from the sixth chapter of the book of Romans, uh, Romans chapter six. There's a verse there in the sixth chapter that says that, that you're not under the law. So if you're not under the law, then you don't have to obey the law, right? Romans six and verse 14 says, for sin shall not have dominion over you, for you're not under the law, but you're under grace. And that verse has become somewhat of an open door for all kinds of crazy ideas and misdeeds and misbehavior. Where it says you're not under the law, that's been interpreted wrongly to say, well, you don't have to, to obey God's law at all. 
Jesus obeyed it for you, so why do you have to obey it? But is that what Paul was saying? Was he saying you don't have to obey the law? I don't think so, because he'd already said back up to the third chapter, he'd already said this in chapter 3 and verse 31, do we then make void the law through faith? God forbid. God forbid, yea, we establish the law. I tell you, grace is indeed a wonderful thing. But it doesn't void the moral law. Just because there's grace doesn't mean I can steal. It doesn't mean I can lie. It doesn't mean I can go around committing mayhem. Uh, we still have to keep the moral principles of the law. You can't commit adultery and say, well, the law doesn't apply anymore. Jesus paid it all. Because Christians, Christians, Christ's followers, are supposed to be law keepers. But law-keeping is the response to grace. It's not the cause of grace. That's important to understand. You didn't get grace because you're so good. You got grace because you were pretty bad. Uh, you were pretty bad and you got grace anyway. Maybe that's a better way to say it. But because I received grace, then I ought to start being good. I can't get good enough to earn grace but ought to respond to grace by being good. Law-keeping is the response to grace. It's not the cause for grace. God didn't save you because you were so good. I've heard people testify about that. God must have seen a spark of good in me. No, God didn't see any spark of good in you. If there's any good in you, he put it there. It's not because God saw something good in you, because when he looked down, he saw a sinner. He saw somebody who lies and steals, who, who's taken the Lord's name in vain, and God only knows what else. And that's what he saw. But he also overwhelmed that with his love. And he gave his grace. So we try to be righteous because of the grace that he's given us. There's a right way and there's a wrong way to respond to the grace of God. The wrong way is to live a life of what the Bible calls wantonness, W-A-N-T-O-N-N-E-S-S. -S. That's a wrong way to respond. The right way to respond is to obey the commandments. Wantonness, don't hear that word very much anymore, but it means lacking restraint, don't have any self-control, it means reckless freedom from any inhibitions. The scripture in Romans 13, Romans chapter 13 and verse 13, tells us how we're supposed to live. But let us walk honestly as in the day, not in rioting or drunkenness, not in chambering and wantonness, not in strife and envy. We're not supposed to walk in wantonness, that unrestrained lifestyle, just whatever feels good, do it, doing what you want, when you want, however often as you want. In Second Peter, he used the same word, wantonness, say Second Peter, the second chapter, and he talks about those who are luring you into sin, and moving you off the right path under the wrong one, and he says in Second Peter 2 and verse 18, for when they speak great swelling words of vanity, they allure through the lusts of the flesh, through much wantonness, those that were clean escaped from them who live in error. Much wantonness. And apparently it can strike those who've received salvation. Um, now maybe these wanton people aren't in gross sins. Maybe they're not committing adultery and lying in the gutter drunk. But I tell you, wantonness can happen if you just try to enjoy this earthly life a little bit too much. Some people look all the time for leisure activities, games and sports and that kind of stuff that consumes the time that they ought to be using to serve the Lord. You can get self-centered. You can get self-indulgent when life becomes all about me, what I want what I'm going to do, what, what brings me pleasure. You can seek to acquire so much treasure on earth that you forget that 
you're supposed to be laying up treasure in heaven. Paul warned in 2 Timothy, the third chapter, about the perilous times in the last days. I won't turn there, but one of the things he said in verse 4 of 2 Timothy 3 was that people would be lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. That's a frightening condition. To me, that's a very good definition of wantonness. Wantonness is when you're loving pleasure more than you love God. Now, I believe you should enjoy life as God blesses you. I mean, there's a lot of good things that you can enjoy in this life. Um, but never allow the pursuit of pleasure to take you so far that it steals your duty to serve God. You know, don't live a wanton and pleasure-mad life. Enjoy pleasures as God allows. But make sure you remember that you're here to serve him. And some people, I've encountered some who've moved beyond wantonness, and they think that since Jesus took all the punishment for sin, that they can sin and they'll never be punished for it. They think they can get away almost literally with murder. Maybe not murder, but I've known people who figured out they could get away with adultery. But I tell you, nobody gets away with anything. You can't sin with impunity. If that is your position, it's a very foolish one. Back to Romans chapter 6. I've been spending a lot of time looking at Romans of late because I want to go through Romans very uh, deeply, verse by verse, in our Tuesday night Bible studies online. But in Romans 6 and verse 1, Paul said, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? It's an interesting question. Thankfully, he answered it right away. God forbid. He seemed to like to use that word, that phrase, God forbid. Uh, <laughs> I think he wanted to be very strong in <laughs> yes. his condemnation of those who thought that because we're in grace, that you can just live however you want to live and just act any way you want to act. He said, <laughs> yes. God forbid. Yes, God How forbid. shall we that are dead to sin live in sin? How can we allow sins to, to uh, be a part of us? Christ did not come to save you in your sins. He came to save you from your sins, to save you out of your sins. Um, while grace spares us God's punishment for our own sins, still, Christianity is a walk of obedience to the moral precepts of God's law. Jesus made this statement in John 14. I forget which verse it is. But in the 14th chapter of John, Jesus said, If you love me, Keep my commandments. Keep my commandments. And really, that's a major theme of the New Testament, is keeping his commandments. In 1 John, the epistle of John, the first epistle of John, 1 John 5 and verse, I think it's verse 2, let me get there. 1 John 5 and verse 2, by this, we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments. But remember, his commandments are not grievous. It's not hard. But why, why John? Why, Jesus? Why do we need to keep the commandments when Jesus already kept them for us? Mm -hmm. uh, why do we keep these commandments when it's not necessary to be saved? If Jesus paid it all, and I don't have to pay it, then why do I try to keep these laws? And I hope to answer that question today. I want to tell you that we need to understand still God's law a little bit. Because for one thing, the law tells us the difference between what's good and what's bad. It tells us the difference between right and wrong. If you don't know God's law, you don't know what's wrong. There's people in this world today that don't know the word of God. And they think that all kinds of confusion and immorality is okay. They think that gay marriage is okay. The majority of Americans in most recent polls are in favor of gay marriage. It's okay. The majority of Americans in most polls think that there should be a right to abortion. 
that if you don't want that baby, that you should be able to kill it. Because they don't know that it's wrong. They've never been taught the difference between right and wrong. But here, right here, here's the difference. This explains the difference between what's mm. right and what's wrong. We need to know God's law to know what's right and what's wrong. Yes. Oh. I'm sharing this. This is beautiful. Romans 3, verse 20. Romans 3 and verse 20 says, By the deeds of the law, no one's going to be justified. It's not, you're not going to be saved because you keep the law. But he didn't stop there in verse 20. He said, For by the law is the knowledge of sin. So we know what sin is by God's law. And we also know that God hates sin. And sin is rebellion against what God considers to be right and good. And if we know something is sin, then, then we ought not be doing that that God hates. I mean, we can't go ahead and, and commit moral transgressions. We should not go against the image of God that's been implanted in our consciousness. You know, I think Adam was made in the likeness and in the image of God, and I know that image has been marred by sin, but there's still something in humanity that God put there that's maybe a broken mirror, but it reflects God somewhat. I've seen mirrors that get distorted. I guess they used to have them in circuses. They made you look fat or made you look thin or whatever, but it was still you. In a cracked mirror, you can still see you in there. And I think if God looks at his image in humanity, it's cracked, it's distorted. We're trying to heal that marred image. But the image of God is still there, and every society that's ever existed has had some concept of right and wrong, because that's part of the image of God. And we ought to do right and avoid the wrong just because that's the way God programmed us. Um, we don't want to violate the moral code that God programmed into humanity. And that's a good enough reason right there for us to start living right instead of justifying our wrongs and say, well, you know, Jesus paid it all, so it doesn't really matter. And, and what about the wantonness that's not really overtly, terribly sinful? Should we still be sacrificing and denying ourselves things that maybe aren't that bad? You know, why sacrifice pleasure for obedience? Why don't we just all go to the theaters and dance halls and sports games and play golf on Sundays, skip Wednesday night service and Sunday night service, like some do. But one of the commands of Jesus was to deny yourself and take up an instrument that's going to kill you. Isn't that Luke 9? Luke chapter 9. There are good blessings that come from being a good person. The Twelve um, explains some, at least, of the blessings of obedience. It's not a real long psalm, but it, it has a, packs a lot into it. In Psalm 112, it starts out, Praise ye the Lord, which is the translation of the word hallelujah. Hallelujah. Then he says, Blessed is the man that feareth the Lord, that delighteth greatly in his commandments. If you want to be blessed, in this life, you may not be happy every day, but you can be blessed every day. If you want to be blessed today, then fear the Lord and delight in his commandments. Verse 2 says, His seed shall be mighty upon the earth, 
the generation of the upright shall be blessed. That means those that, that you generate. Maybe your children, if not your children, your grandchildren. Maybe your great-grandchildren. Maybe your great-great-grandchildren. But all of them are going to be affected by the kind of life you live right now. You may not know, but if you had a family relationship with your grandparents, some of the way that they lived, some of the way they acted, some of what they believed has been woven into your very character. And the decisions that you make and the way that you act may impact generations to come. They might not even be your offspring, but they may be somebody that you cared for as a child or developed a relationship with them and what you did will have lasting impact the generation of the upright shall be blessed mm -hmm. if you delight greatly in his commandments and fear the Lord verse 3 says wealth and riches shall be in his house I'm not a wealthy man. I'm comfortable. I've got plenty. But I tell you, my house has been rich. For years, ever since I moved out of my parents' home on my wedding day in 1976, my house has been blessed with wealth that I wouldn't trade for anything. It's been a rich life, one that I didn't expect to be so rich, but it has been a very rich life with experiences that, that I wouldn't sell for all the money in the world. Verse 3, wealth and riches shall be in his house, and his righteousness endureth forever. His righteousness. You ought to live right. Verse 4, unto the upright there ariseth light in the darkness. Doesn't say that you won't have that you'll have no dark days. Indeed, you will have dark days in life. But the wonderful thing about being an upright person, living right, keeping his commandments, is that he's promised that in that darkness, he'll shine a light. He may not shine it as quickly as you want. He may not show you the path that you thought you wanted to walk. But I tell you, he will light your candle in Amen. the darkness. He always has. He always will. That's because he is gracious. But... It's not talking about the Lord being gracious. It's talking about an upright man or woman here in verse 4. Under the upright there ariseth light and darkness because he or she is gracious and full of compassion and righteous. You want to know how to live? Live a gracious life. Not one that's hard and bitter, condemning, sarcastic. But live a gracious life. Treat people with grace with respect, with dignity. Be full of compassion. When somebody says something or does something that maybe it hurts you, instead of getting upset, why don't you show some compassion? Say, they must have really been going through it. They must have been going through something right then or they wouldn't have acted that way. I know them better than that. Or when somebody's suffering, why don't you feel their suffering deep down on the inside? Go to God on their behalf. I'm not, I probably shouldn't use myself as an example. I'm a poor example of so many things. But when Brother Charles was up trying to caulk and try to stop the leaks in our foyer up 40, 50 feet in the air, Friday night, it started raining and sleeting. I was standing out there watching him and I thought, he, this is bad. 
and I felt for him because it was already cold, it was already windy, and then it was getting wet. And I started praying that the Lord would stop the rain. Praise God. And probably not because of my prayers, maybe it was just a mere coincidence. I don't know, I'd rather give glory to God. But it wasn't very long and that rain stopped. And a little while after that, the sun broke through the clouds. And I thought, thank you, Lord. There wasn't much I could do to make it easier for Brother Charles. Anymore, I'm afraid of heights. I wasn't gonna get up there with him. I'd have fallen to my death anyway. But I could pray. Anyway, you ought to live a life that's gracious, full of compassion, and righteous. Verse 5 says, A good man showeth favor and lendeth. Um, he's not stingy. He's not um, all self-centered. He will guide his affairs with discretion. Surely he shall not be moved forever. That doesn't mean he'll be moved, but not forever. I think it means forever he'll not be moved. I think he's standing on the right foundation, that he is on a firm foundation. And as a person on that firm foundation of God's love, and God's grace, and an understanding of God's word, that he's not going to let the events of life shake him and move him off of that foundation. We're supposed to be steadfast, unmovable, the Bible says. Amen. Always abounding. That's what we're supposed to do. Yes, God. The end of verse 5 says he will guide his affairs with discretion. That means he thinks things through. Praise God. He doesn't just act on a whim, Amen. but he considers. Amen. Is this the right thing? Is this the right way? Am I doing this right? Am I going about it in the right way? Is this what the Lord wants? God, I think every one of us ought to be praying, Lord, what do you want in your, out of yes. your life? I'm asking the Lord, what does he want out of the rest of my life? Yes. As a, without my wife by my side, what does he want? I want to be, have discretion in making the right decisions. Verse 6, surely he shall not be moved forever. Uh, the righteous shall be in everlasting remembrance. <sighs> everlasting remembrance. Now, I told you the other day I walked in a graveyard in, in England one time that had graves that were so old you couldn't even read the names or the dates. Nobody remembers those persons. But I tell you, the righteous, they'll be in the Lord's remembrance forever. But there's some who are going to be in the remembrance of God's people forever too. I tell you, this... this the elect are never going to forget King David. They're never going to forget Isaiah. He may well have been sawn in two to end his life, but we're not going to forget him. We're not going to forget a name like Will Souders. Or I could just go on and on and on. It may not be in the history books, but they're going to be in everlasting remembrance. Verse 7, I need to keep moving here. He shall not be afraid of evil tidings. Doesn't mean evil tidings won't come. They will come. But they're not afraid in the midst of those evil tidings because their confidence is in God. Amen. They've been living right. His heart is fixed, trusting the Lord. Lord, there must be a reason. They're like, dear sister Abshire passed away was part of this assembly, she said, Lord, I'm going to enjoy watching you work this out for me. It was a problem she didn't know the answer to, but she knew that the Lord was going to work it out. Mm -hmm. Verse 8, his heart is established. Mm -hmm. He shall not be afraid. you will see what God does to those that are against him until he mm -hmm. sees his desire upon his enemies. Praise God. He hath dispersed. He has given to the poor. Now remember that verse when we get around to the offering. He hath dispersed. He's not stingy. He's not greedy. Very giving. Very giving. His righteousness endureth forever. Not just during his lifetime, but forever. 
his horn, that means his influence, his authority, his reputation, shall be exalted with honor. The wicked shall see it and be grieved and gnash with their teeth and melt away. The desire of the wicked will perish, but it pays to keep the commandments of God. And this 112th Psalm might not just be about temporal blessings for this life, but it seems to promise eternal blessings. It repeatedly assures us of what will endure forever. This righteousness will endure forever. Mm -hmm. uh, imputed righteousness is what saves you, but the magnitude of your reward might depend, at least in part, upon how righteous you live and act in this life. I mean, you could amass a, a fortune equal to Bill Gates. You could write like Charles Dickens. You could conquer an empire like Alexander the Great, but none of that will endure forever. What can you do that will endure forever? Why, well, you can obey God's law. You can fear the Lord and delight greatly in his commandments, and that's going to endure forever. You can live the way he wants you to live. And the memory of your life will endure forever. And maybe your reward in the kingdom will be in proportion to your obedience. You might be saved by grace but placed by works. And your good works might even qualify you to be one of the 144,000 in the bride of Christ. But even if you just focus on this life, the blessings and the cursings that are in Deuteronomy 28 are good enough reason to me to keep the law. Amen. I'd like to be blessed in the city, blessed in the field, Amen. blessed when you come in, blessed when you go out. Amen. So that's a good reason to keep his commandments because of the blessings in this life. Amen. Another second good reason for our good works is because they're part of God's plan. We need to fit our works, our life, into the plan of God. Earthly rewards are not the chief goal in life, but we're here to serve the Lord. Remember that we were saved to serve. Not saved so we could enjoy life better. Not saved to serve ourselves, but we're saved to serve the Lord. Earthly benefits are nice. I enjoy them. But we aren't serving God just for the earthly benefits. We're seeking eternal life in full fellowship with him. Now God has a plan for the ages. Now our lives occupy a small portion of the overall plan of God. God's been working for 6,000 years on the restoration of paradise and eternal life for the redeemed. And over that 6,000 years, he might give you 50 or 80 or 92 years. But you need to fit your 50 or 80 or 92 years into the overall plan of God. Amen. Because God has been working with a people, That's so true. not just a group of persons, but a people in every generation and we've been chosen to be part of that people in this generation and the plan of God is God's plan but it's accomplished through human deeds I mean the gospel will save souls but God uses humans to preach it I mean it was God's plan to save the Jewish people from Haman's destruction. And God could have miraculously intervened and saved the Jews, but instead, a little girl by the name of Hadassah or Esther is the one who intervened to save God's people. God doesn't mow the church lawn. He depends on the good works of our brothers. His plan requires good works. Uh, 
turn you to Ephesians, the second chapter. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. God's plan was for us to walk in good works. We were created to do good works. Even small acts can have major consequences. And some of those consequences may not even be apparent for years, but just a kind word that maybe you said may affect somebody's long-term destiny or a decision that can have, as I said, generational impact. And my grandparents heard a song And they made a decision to walk into a little humble building at the corner of Maryland and Raleigh Streets in Evansville, Indiana in the 1920s. And that decision that they made to walk into that building is affecting my life today. And it's affecting my granddaughters today. If they hadn't have made that decision, nearly a hundred years ago, what of the consequences have been in the life, I'll just get personal with my life, my children's life, my grandchildren's life, and who knows how many more generations before the Lord comes. So second good reason for obeying God's law is because that's God's plan. Third reason is because obedience will lessen some of the inevitable sorrows of this life. This Christian walk, this Christian life is not always deliriously happy. Every day is not always enjoyably wonderful. Some days are dark, some days are difficult. But obedience limits the darkness that you'll encounter and may allow you to avoid some of the dark days altogether. See, a, a, a wise child, a smart child, learns quickly with a minimum of parental chastisement. A foolish child needs a lot of chastisement. I tried as a child not to get in trouble for the same thing over and over again. I mean, usually getting whipped one time was enough for me, on that point anyway. I tried not to get whipped multiple times for the same rebellion. I think it would be kind of foolish knowing the coming discipline to keep doing the wrong over and over again. And Proverbs 19:18 says to chasten your child while there's hope. Don't spare for his crying. And so this point may be just another way of saying you'll be blessed for obedience, but I want to emphasize here that disobedience brings chastisement and sorrow. It tells us in Hebrews 12, Brother Zachary will find the verse for me, but it tells us in Hebrews 12 that whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth. And he scourges every son that he receives. Now he's not punishing them for their guilt, but he's lovingly correcting them for wrong attitudes, wrong acts. And I would like to skate through life with a minimum of God's chastisement rather than the maximum of God's chastisement. And so obedience helps me to minimize that chastisement and you get down to, oh, let me just turn, my mind goes to the 128th Psalm. I think it applies here. Psalms 128, where it's going through how good it is when you're not being chastised. Psalms 128.1, Blessed is everyone that feareth the Lord, that walketh in his ways. 
Sounds like what we just read in Psalms 112. For thou shalt eat the labor of thine hands. Happy shalt thou be, and it shall be well with thee. Now that's a pretty good way to go through life. Now the Lord's going to chastise you to get you doing the right thing. But I'd rather have a minimum of that chastisement. Yes. In one of the earlier Psalms, David said that you're my hiding place, Lord. Yes. Preserve me uh, from all kinds of trouble. So that's a good reason to be obedient to the commands of God. Then the next one, I'm not counting, what is this, number four probably? Is that obedience in itself is an act of worship. We are honoring the Lord. We're worshiping him when we're obedient. Mm -hmm. The word worship doesn't mean praise. Mm -hmm. Praise is something we offer to God. But the mm -hmm. word obedience means submission. I mean, the word worship, pardon me, worship mm -hmm. means submission. Mm -hmm. The most common word that's translated as worship in the Bible literally means to bow down. It's a gesture of respect and submission to God. By obeying God's moral law, we're showing him that we honor him, that we respect him, that we submit to his will. Um, oh, well, I'm right here in Psalms. Let's go to Psalms 119. In verse 33, it says, Teach me, O Lord, the way of thy statutes, and I shall keep it unto the end. Give me understanding, and I shall keep thy law. Yea, I shall observe it with my whole heart. The Living Bible's translation of those two verses says, Just tell me what to do, and I'll do it. As long as I live, I'll obey. And that's a pretty good attitude. Lord, just tell me what to do, and I'll do it. Number five. Obedience will draw you closer to God. Yes, amen. It's not just a way to worship Him. Yes. But it's a way to get closer to Him. Yes. To prepare you for whatever He leads you to. Help you grow as a Christ follower. It's James 4 and verse 8 that says, Draw nigh to God, and He'll draw nigh to you. I'll cleanse your hands, you sinners. I think he goes on to say, and purify your hearts. But if you draw close to God, he's going to draw close to you. And the Bible speaks of different persons like Enoch, who walked with God. But the Lord can't fellowship wrong attitudes, and wrong spirits, and wrong acts. He can't fellowship sin. I think that's Isaiah 59 2 that says your sins and your iniquities have separated you between you and your God and he's not really interested in our foolishness God's not interested in our vanity but he does love our obedience living a Christ-like life doesn't save us but it it does draw our close us closer to the Lord and wouldn't that be a good place to be close to the Lord? Let me just back up a few more pages here in Psalms to the 91st Psalm. Talk about a good place to be. To be under the shadow of his wings. Psalm 91, oh, I probably could go through the whole chapter here, but I'll try not to. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I'll say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress, my God, in him will I trust. He's going to deliver you from the snares and pestilences. He'll cover you with his feathers and under his wings you'll trust. His truth will be your defense, your shield and your buckler. You won't need to be afraid of terror or pestilence or destruction. Why? Verse 9, because thou hast made the Lord, which is my refuge, even the Most High, thy habitations. Because you've drawn closer to the Lord. So that was point five, if I remember right. Draws you closer to the Lord to obey. Point six, obedience is part of our 
progressive sanctification. It's part of what the overcoming life is all about. Sanctification is different from justification. You're justified by grace. That means you're not going to be punished for your sins. But sanctification um, means you're being separated unto God, separated for some um, higher purpose, for some sacred work. You're being separated from sin. There's an initial separation when you're saved, when you repent. <clears throat> there's a separation when you're justified by the Holy Ghost. But then there's more separation from sin throughout the rest of your life. And it's the work of incorporating God's Word into your life. Jesus made this statement in his high priestly prayer in John 17 and verse 17. He said, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. It's the sanctification that, that the washing of the water by the word works in us. For us to grow spiritually, to progress in sanctification, we have to bring our lives into conformity with the will of God. Yes. And he revealed his will for us right here in his law and his commandments. Jesus is looking for a glorious church. Isn't that Ephesians 5 and verse 25? I think it is. Um, that he wants a church that's sanctified by the word of God. Yes. Ephesians 5 and verse 25 says that, that husbands are to love their wives even as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. That he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, by the word of God. And then it will become a glorious church. Verse 27 says, the word washing by the word there in verse 26, that's kind of interesting to me, I'm not a Greek scholar, but usually when you see the word word, W-O-R-D, it's a translation of logos. Like in the beginning was the word. But it's not logos here in verse 26. It's rhema. R-H-E-M-A. Rhema is a different word. It means a, an utterance or, or what God has said. And it's what God has said that's going to sanctify us. It's what God said here. It's what God said right here. What God has proclaimed and what he proclaims through our sanctified lives if we're living epistles separates us from those that have not been redeemed and those that are still steeped in sin. Uh, Jesus said this in John. He said, uh, he said, you're not of the world. He said, if you were of the world, the world would love you. But because you're not of the world, the world's going to hate you. There's a real difference. There's only really two people in the Bible. In New Testament times, there's the body of Christ and then there's the world. And the world's going to hate you if you follow Christ. And yet that's what the Lord's asked us to do. To be Christ followers as part of our sanctification. The more we do what the Lord has said to do, the more sanctified we are. We can either get close to the world and be close to sin, or we can be far from those things yes. of the world Praise and be close to God. And we all know the verse in Romans 12, too, to be not conformed to the world, but to be transformed by the renewing of our minds. Finally, my last point, why should we obey the Lord? Because he asked us to. Yes. <laughs> Quite simply. That's Christ. He asked us to. Obedience is a profound statement of gratitude. It's the way I can say thank you, Lord, for saving me. The Lord, so many times in the Bible, he said, keep my statutes. He said it four times just in the book of Leviticus. He 
said in Ezekiel, keep my laws and my statutes. Uh, several times in the Old Testament, he said, keep my judgments. He said in other verses, to do my judgments, to do my statutes. And maybe there's some things about what God's asked that we don't understand. Some of it may not seem to be even logical in our minds. But you know, God doesn't owe you an explanation or a reason for the things he asks you to do. He gave us a law and he asked us to keep it. Whether we understand, whether we even agree, we're still supposed to obey. You know, it's probably good for you. If you're on a job, there may be some rules on that job. And you may not like those rules. You might not understand them. You may not even agree with them. But if you want to keep your job, you probably ought not violate those rules. I didn't serve in the military, but in basic training, if the drill sergeant tells you to do something, you may not agree with what the drill sergeant told you to do. You better not disagree too loudly. You may not understand why. Why do I have to strip this gun down and put it back together again? I just did. But if the drill sergeant says to do it, you better do it. Because you'll find you get in a whole lot less trouble if you do it than if you don't. I mean, even if you got a button unbuttoned on your shirt where it flat buttons down. You can get all kind of trouble for not buttoning that button. Yeah, they'll walk up to you and say, do you want this button? And you, if you say no, they'll take it and put it in their pocket. If you say yes, they'll pull it off and hand it to you. You can go sew it back on. I'm not saying God's a drill sergeant. Please don't, don't get me wrong. I don't mean that at all. He's a loving, compassionate, wonderful, wonderful Lord. But he's asked us to obey, and he's given us so much. I really think he's not asking too much of us. And Samuel the prophet said this to, to King Saul. We just read it a few weeks ago, if you're going through your Bible with us chronologically. But in 1 Samuel 15, King Saul was told to do something, and instead he thought he could do something better. He was supposed to slay all of the, even of the animals of these Amalekites. And he thought, no, I'll save these animals and we'll offer them as a sacrifice to the Lord. And Samuel the prophet said to him in verse 22 of 1 Samuel 15, 1 Samuel 15, 22, he said, Hath the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to hearken is better than the fat of rams. Um, does the Lord have as great delight in sacrificing as he does in obedience? just strikes me that the Lord delights in our obedience. Mm. Not that he just expects it. And I know God doesn't experience emotions the way humans do, mm. but there's something about the very nature of God that is pleased, that delights, that's happy to use human yes. emotional expressions. Yes. There's something that that brings pleasure to the soul of God mm -hmm. when he sees his people acting right. Mm -hmm. What does godliness mean anyway? It means trying to act like God. Uh, Brother James Souders used to talk about 
we need to duplicate God in all of his duplicatable ways. Or duplicate Christ in all of his duplicatable ways. There's some things about Christ we can't duplicate. We can't walk on water. We can't turn water into wine. Yes. But there's a lot about Christ that we can be Christ-like. Mm -hmm. There's a lot about our God that we can be godly. Mm -hmm. Godliness is something we should all be striving for. Mm -hmm. And so we say thank you to the Lord when we obey his moral precepts, yes. when we sacrifice our pleasures for his service, and when we live the way he's asked us to live. Mm -hmm. So in conclusion, I'll just say this, that no human can ever be good enough or righteous enough to merit salvation. Um, I'm going to delve deeply into that truth in the lessons on the book of Romans in our Tuesday night Facebook sessions, and I encourage people to watch them. But even though we can't earn salvation, even though it's freely given as a gift from God, and even though the sacrificial atoning death of Jesus did all that was needed, to free us from the penalty of sin and to transfer righteousness to us still, we're supposed to be good and faithful servants. Praise God. We can't fall into the trap of thinking it doesn't matter how we live, it doesn't matter how we act, because Christ, he paid it all. Praise God. And we are still to obey his commands. Amen. Not to earn his righteousness or not to earn saving righteousness, we do it for other valid reasons, like I went through these five or six or seven, however many it was. Mm -hmm. And that's probably not a complete list of all the reasons we should be obedient. I'm sure there's other good reasons. But I hope these are enough to, to point out that we should live a life of submission and obedience to the mm -hmm. commandments of the Lord. Let's Praise be Christ God. followers. Praise Let's God. be disciples. Amen. Let's be those who are striving to be like he was. Yes. Meek, gentle, loving, caring, good, upright, and righteous. Amen. 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 All right, God. let's see here. <clears throat>